Welcome to You Can't Get to Heaven in a Miniskirt podcast. And this is the podcast where we talk about how you should not wear miniskirts because you're a slut. <laughs> You're a big old slut. <laughs> I am Jessica. And my name's Sarah. And if you'd like to find us on social media, you can find us on Instagram and TikTok at Heaven in a Mini Skirt. And our website is Heaven in a Mini Skirt.com. And today I am exhausted from reading this horrible book that we made ourselves read. Yes. Sarah's holding it up to the camera as if we are a video podcast, but we're not. <laughs> but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not. It is Boy Meets Girl Say Hello to Courtship by Joshua Harris. And it's real bad. So bad. Like, it was painful rereading this book. To start out, we did an episode of one of Josh Harris's books called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. It was like our fifth episode we we did. And so before listening to this one, if you haven't listened to our I Kiss Dating Goodbye episode, it might be a good idea to go do that. It was fun to do and it give, it'll give you some more context to his next book, which is the one we're reading now. It's essentially the, the part one. It's... It's him being like, oh, dating's bad. I'm going to do courtship. And then the boy meets girl, say hello to courtship, is about him meeting his now ex-wife, but his <laughs> wife of many years and the mother of his three children. <laughs> his now ex-wife, yes. And so Josh Harris, you know, we talked about it in I Kiss Dating Goodbye, but he is an interesting character. How do you describe Josh Harris? Josh Harris is a former pastor. Former Christian. <laughs> Christian author, former Christian. Who I think is, I think is a, seems like a pretty genuine, cool human. Mm -hmm. I said this on the first episode that we, that we got a little bit into his bio, but he's really stirred some shit up and he was kind of like one of the main contributors to purity culture and true love weights and a lot of the purity movement and a lot of what was really awful in 90s and 2000s Christianity. So I think he feels really bad and he's, yeah. he said sorry many times. Yeah, the thing is that while reading this book, the only way I could get through it without losing my mind was knowing that everything that he says in this book obviously has since been recanted. It is so bad. Also, we need to remember that this was written in the early 2000s. So it doesn't make what he says okay, but it'll give you more context as to what the maybe the world was like back then. And we talked about that in the I Kiss Dating Goodbye episode that like 2002 was very different than 2023. We have to remember that. And Buddy was like in his early 20s and now he's in his 40s. Like dude was like 22 years old. He was a kid. So he did a TED talk. And we have both seen his TED Talk. I would recommend going and watching his TED Talk if you're interested. I'm going to put it in the show notes. And it's not very long. I think it's like 10 minutes. So the title of the TED Talk is Strong Enough to be Wrong. And I really do like his TED Talk. He did the TED Talk, I think, maybe before he came out as non-Christian, but after he came out and apologized. He was still a pastor at the time. Yeah, so it was kind of yeah. like this in-between stage where he was like, I apologize for what I've done. And yet, I'm still a Christian. But it's really, really good. He talks about how admitting that we're wrong will help us evolve and become better people. And we can't rush through the process of admitting that we're wrong. You have to go through the process and take that time. And then admitting that you're wrong is going to upset a lot of people. Because then you are essentially saying that they're wrong. And so that is something that he talks about. And it's really, really good. I mean, admitting that you're wrong is really hard. Like someone like a pastor who probably has a pretty big ego... That would be really hard to admit that you're wrong. And I can't imagine what he went through in this process. Well, he was like screwed on all sides because on one hand, you had like the right wing fundamentalist Christians that this book was like gospel for them. It was a guide to how to navigate dating or what they call courtship, which is an alternative to dating and roles and gender within marriage. And so like you had all these people that were mad being like, oh my gosh, you're going to lead all these people astray now because you're saying this approach which worked for us or this approach which we subscribe to is correct and then you have everyone else being like you fucked me up like yes i got married at 19 and you gave me like wrong ideas about marriage about what it is to be a man woman a human people are pissed on all ends and the poor guy can't escape it he can't and he's still on social media like i think bravely too because personally i would have deleted all my social media and he doesn't like he has a public profile that you can follow he's done his apology tour right like he's done all of the things 
I think he he's moved on with his life. So he wrote this book. It sold a shitload of copies. This book is really really pop was really really popular. Um, as we talked about in the I Kiss Dating Goodbye episode, he has halted all publication on all of his books. So you can find this book. Sarah found it at a Christian thrift store for a dollar twenty five. Yeah. So you can find it, but you can't apparently you can't buy it new or like they're not making more copies you can buy them like used on amazon but there's no there's no kindle version because this is pre e-readers yeah this is pre cell phones like let's be honest this is like ancient yeah oh something that i want to say <laughs> fuck something that i want to say before we get started is okay this book is about getting married young mo- mostly like he doesn't really talk about like the age that you should get married but there's like the rules of like your courtship i just want to say <laughs> that i don't give a fuck how old you are when you get married i made a video that has gone viral on instagram it has almost four million views as of right now i imagine it'll be higher when this comes out it's been horrible. We don't even know what to do. I don't even... I, it's like a whole other level of, of exposure. and Yeah, and it's been great because I think that some people that are listening today would have found our podcast from this video. And the video was a joke. And I told a true story about a dumb person that I dated when I was 18, 19. And I dated a lot of dumb people, okay? I did not have good taste in men when I was that age. And as everybody on the comments likes to remind me, I am an idiot for not having good taste in men, and I guess I wasn't raised right. The comments have been have been pretty hard to deal with. One thing that, like, people keep calling me, like, a old, bitter lady. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I think it, putting this video up has been a very interesting look into humanity. Now, I shouldn't call, like, shitty internet people humanity as a whole, but it does show how many people are just kind of in pain and people that are hurt and people that just want to put me down because they're hurt. I really don't care if you get married at 18. Like, I really, really don't. I don't know how else to say it. That being said, okay, so continuing on, I'm happy that I didn't get married when I was 18 because not because of the person I was dating at 18, but because I like had no idea what marriage meant when I was in my late teens, early 20s, even mid 20s. Like I didn't understand the concept of commitment. And I think I thought I did. Like I definitely was like, oh, I I can get married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But until you kind of hit your late 20s, and this was just for me personally, until I hit my late 20s, I didn't understand really the concept of what it meant to be with someone for a very long time. And I maybe I still don't understand. I am married and it's great, but like I'm really happy that I didn't get married that young because it's hard. It's really it's hard and it's it's hard and good and it's it is hard. Having kids is hard and and I mean as someone who's gone through a divorce from a marriage that was like in my mid 20s. I don't I mean obvi- obviously it was for different reasons because I figured out my sexuality and things like that. I don't regret it, but divorce isn't easy and obviously you don't wish that on anyone. You know, co-parenting and having kids, I, I hate the term broken home, but have you know having to deal to deal with like, you know, someone that you're not with that you're also parenting the humans that you love with. And I, in my situation, I'm pretty lucky, but like I've heard, you know, there's all kinds of nasty situations. And I've kind of seen it all in people we knew that got married young. Some people are still together. Some people had really nasty divorces, affairs, yeah. um, you know. Yeah, like it's tough. Because Sarah and I grew up Christian, we know a lot of people that got married young, as young as, you know, 18. And many people got married before they were 20. And people that are 30 and they're they're divorced twice. But there's also people that are still together. So we don't want to be like, oh, don't get married young. Because it could work. I'm not saying that it doesn't work. Some of the comments actually on the video were like, I got married young, but I wouldn't recommend it because it is hard and they have no regrets, but it is hard to get married that young. And I can understand if you have religious views and you don't want to live with someone or have sex with someone before marriage, it is enticing to get married young because you want to get married and you want to have sex. And I do understand that, but you shouldn't get married just because you want to have sex. You should just have sex. But 
I, I can't really, like, tell somebody to have sex. That's not really nice because everyone has their own different beliefs about that. There are studies that show that people who don't live together until they're married actually are less likely to get divorced. I haven't seen that study. But, I, I yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I just... I, I don't think you can, like, prescribe a one-size-fits-all. I think you were just like, oh, these are 18 and 19-year-olds. And getting married doesn't mean that you are mature. Yes. Like, I think that's the thing where they're like, oh, we're so mature and grown up because we're getting married. We're more mature than everyone else. And it's like, no, you're 18. Your brain's still developing, like, yeah. regardless of, like, how mature you think you are, you still have a ways to go. Yeah, and I think that that's a beautiful thing. I think that's something that I resisted when I was that age was, like, I thought that I was done developing. in my, my I thought my brain was done developing. And it's, like, really not. Like, I don't think I, that I could have understood, though, at that age, how different I was going to be in my 30s than I was in my late teens, early 20s. Thank God, too, because I really struggled in my 20s. And I spend my whole 20s figuring out who I am as a person. And I think that is what your 20s are for. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be with someone. You can make commitments when you're that age. It's not that. Like, you can make decisions. It's just... You can be a good parent you can like there's all kinds of things you can do it's just different it looks different yeah and and it's all personal preference so i just wanted to like say that i don't give a fuck and it was a joke like i'm sure nobody cares in that's listening. folks this is the closest you're getting to an apology from <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait wait what's like the when people get canceled what's their apology they're like i regret my mistakes and i will be doing better and educating myself <laughs> Yeah, and I'm... That's exactly what I'm saying right now. I'm going to be silent, and I want to amplify voices. <laughs> and I'm going to bring more perspective on this. So I'm going to be silent on my comments on early marriage, and I'm going to amplify the voice of Joshua Harris from 2002. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you. Yes, let's amplify this horrible fucking book. So moving on, I was doing a little bit of research on Josh Harris just before we recorded, and he has a, a website, and he has a statement on his website about I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Like, he has a website for, like, other stuff, and there's literally, like, an entire section that's just like, if you're wondering, I apologize. So should I read the statement? Yeah. It's, like, kind of long, but I want to read it because I think it'll just be like, okay, this is just the, the overview of what he thinks now. Okay, so this is just specifically about I Kissed Eating Goodbye, but I'm sure his other books damage people as well. Okay, statement is, quote, Needless to say, my thinking has changed significantly in the past 20 years. I no longer agree with its central idea that dating should be avoided. I now think dating can be a healthy part of a person developing relationally and learning the qualities that matter most in a partner. In the time since my books were unpublished and the documentary was released, so he made like a documentary, um, we talked about that in the other podcast, my beliefs have shifted significantly. My own marriage ended. I see how damaging purity culture and its ideas about sex and gender have been to so many, myself included. In particular, I've apologized for ways my books and teachings harmed LGBTQ plus people. At the time I filmed a documentary about my reevaluation, I was trying to do so within the confines of the evangelical church I'd found home for so long. But since I've realized I no longer believe in the same way, while I no longer identify as a Christian, I'm grateful for people both within and outside the church who are talking honestly about religious trauma, the danger of purity culture teaching, and the danger of manipulative, controlling, fear-based religion. So that's really interesting. That last line, yeah. the danger of manipulative, controlling, and fear-based religion. When I read that, I was like, whoa. Like, <laughs> so that's his statement. That is a really good overview of obviously what he thinks now. It's a good overview of his TED Talk. He does feel really bad for what he said because we are about to get into this book and it is fucked it is fucked yeah and again there are just so there are stories from the book that uh, even though i haven't read the book since i read it initially in like 2003 or 4 and then i probably read it again in like 2005 2006 but i haven't read this one since then and rereading it this week i was like i legit remember this story i was like when is the hammock story gonna come up and i'm like oh yeah the hammock, <laughs> the hammock story oh, the hammock. <laughs> I have, oh, I have like a dog-eared my... in this book because I don't really give a shit about this dollar twenty-five book. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I can't wait for the hammock story. That's later though. We got to get through quite a bit. <laughs> the hammock story so stupid. So, and we actually talked about that in the other episode, but yeah. So that is a good overview. I just like I want to make sure that people have a really good context of where we're coming from before we start uh, reviewing this book. So he was twenty-four when this book was published. So he wrote it when he was like twenty-two, twenty-three. So, yeah, it's not good. So what you're basically about to embark on is marriage and relationship advice from a 23 year old. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, what the fuck? 
I can imagine, though, Sarah, you read this when you were 13, 14. 13, yeah. And getting relationship advice from a 23 year old probably was like oh wow like this guy knows what he's talking about well i mean our youth leaders and youth pastors weren't that much older than that right these are the people that we put on a pedestal and we're like this person is so wise and they're giving me a formula of how to navigate all these hard teenage issues from a christian perspective based on the bible you're like this is gold like this is what i need to do to have a happy life yes and you're like all i have to do is follow these set of rules and everything will be great and i think that's kind of the downfall of this book is that like so many people were like i followed every rule and then i got married and it did not work out and it's so harmful like the way he presents gender the role of men and women it's just it makes me so uncomfortable because i just keep having flashbacks about like certain stories like i remember one of my friends that was really into this book as well And she, at the time, after reading this book, she was like, I need to make room for my boyfriend to pursue me. Keep in mind, she was 14 and he was 16, and she would not call him. Because back then, we didn't really text as much. Like, she would never call him. He had to be the one that called her. Because she's like, I need to make sure that he's the leader. And it's so funny now, because, like, she's still a Christian, but she's a huge feminist, super pro-LGBTQIA rights. Like, she's... She's not subscribing to this shit. (laughs) Yeah, in a very egalitarian marriage, but you eat that shit up when you're 13, 14. You do. It feels, and it feels good. It yeah. feels good to be like, oh, there's a set of rules I can just follow. And, and it's, it's godly and it's exactly what I need. And you just want to, you want to be pure and you want to be holy and hormones and puberty just make that so fucking hard. So, oh my God, it's so hard. I can't believe adults are telling this to teens because they don't remember how horrible those years are when you start going through puberty. It's really intense and like learning this stuff while you're going through puberty is just a recipe for having a fucked up sex life for the rest of your life really like i can attest to that so should we actually talk about the book like yeah let's do I it feel like... let's talk about the book hey guys thanks for listening to us talk about talking about the book but now we're going to talk about the book so the intro uh the beginning of the book describes his feelings about his soon-to-be wife her name is shannon in what I can only describe as, like, an insane manifesto by a teenager. Like, he describes how he, like, is crushing on Shannon and basically telling everyone he knows about it, looking for, like, counsel. And because he needs to know if this is, like, God's plan. And he, like, won't ask her out. But And this goes on for months, apparently, before he even asks her out. And I'm like, just ask her out, dude. Like, if you like her, it's okay. Like, he's, like, he's not okay with liking this woman. But she didn't have a godly father that he could go ask to, right? Yeah, that's a big one is that Shannon was a, what, a born again Christian? Is that what that would be called? But before she got born again, Shannon had sex. She had lots of boyfriends and lots of sex. So, okay, he defines courtship. So he says, what is courtship? It's dating with a purpose. It's friendship plus possibility. It's romance chaperoned by wisdom. That's what I mean by setting a clear course for romance. It's not without risk. It's simply a way to be careful with the other person's heart while opening up your lives together to God's joyful best. So that is the definition of courtship. It's like friendship with the intention of possible eventual marriage. But you're under the guidance of Christian godly men in your lives and you go on group dates. Can you imagine just like the validation you would feel from the church if you went through a courtship like this and had all those people helping you out? Like that's very enticing to teenagers being like, oh, they're validating me. I feel like an adult. I think there are positives to having adults and people that have been through marriage struggles that are older in your lives that are gonna like support you as a couple i think that's the whole point of like a wedding where people are like we're standing with this couple and we are gonna we are gonna like support them and help them through hard times community community is important for anyone he does have an entire chapter about community yeah but yeah absolutely so this book like his book like his dating goodbye is in three parts he loves to split he loves lists he loves to split things into different parts this is a big thing for josh harris i also just want to say that this book is just so poorly written it was just it was painful to get through because it's just like inside the mind of a homeschooled 23 year old boy and he talks with such confidence it's just but i think that's what it made so appealing to people because he's speaking with such authority he's not like just like this is our way he's like this is the way this is how you do it 
this is how you you be godly. So part one defines courtship and explains the process a bit. What bothers me about this chapter and about this book is, like we said, it is like step by step. If you follow these steps, you will be happy in your marriage. You'll have a successful marriage. And I think that maybe a lot of people go, okay, great. I don't need to follow my gut. I need to follow these rules, right? Well, your gut is wrong. Yeah. Your gut is sinful and depraved. The and... implications of telling people that is massive. I can't imagine. And we've seen it. Like Josh Harris has seen it. You're shutting down your own internal warning system, which cults do that. Yeah. So you cannot trust yourself. <sighs> yeah, that's a that's bad. And then he has this idea of like guarding your heart. Like you don't want to go through heartbreak. But like isn't failure and heartbreak just an inevitable part of life? Maybe not heartbreak, but like failure. If you never fail, are you ever going to grow? That's what I want to know. I remember the phrase guard your heart. Like it comes from scripture saying to can I read the verse? Of course. Yeah. Um, let me find it. King Solomon. So the son of uh, David. Ooh, King David. yeah. Rapist David. Rape. Um, okay, so King, so King, <laughs> King Solomon says, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs 4, 23. Okay, so this is this verse is used a lot. I don't know the exact context, but it's used a lot to say, like, guard your heart because, like, your heart is precious. And, you know, if you're constantly – if you give your heart away, then, like, it's gone. It's kind of like your virginity. It's gone. And, like, then you're going to have all this baggage you're carrying around and all this, like – all this gum stuck to you. The gum. <laughs> I feel like I feel like uh, the baggage is huge in a Christian relationship. It's like you don't want baggage, and I'm like, I think baggage, if you've worked through your baggage, is very good. It makes you a more well-rounded person. I don't want to date someone with no baggage. I don't want to date somebody that's never had a life experience. Yeah. How uninteresting would they be? They'd be like fucking dating a cardboard box. There's a really good song by Andy Grammer, and it's like to his kids, and it's called "I Wish You Pain," and. I find the concept really interesting because, like, you don't want to see people go through pain, but really that is, it is character building. And you're totally right being like, it's baggage coming into something without baggage because then you're completely unprepared for the difficulties of life. And how are you going to expect to be able to grow with someone else and face all that if you've not been through anything? I think for me... I personally needed to go through lots of failure in order to have any character at all. I was like, I was like such a moldable, like you could have manipulated the shit out of me when I was young. I think I, I did get manipulated a lot because I had no idea what was going on. No matter what your parents tell you and how prepared, you have to go through it. Oh, 100%. So that's part one. I mean, this was probably the least interesting chapter in terms of like shock value. Um, but it just kind of defines what a courtship is and it explains the process of like, it's always the man that pursues. And we talk about gender roles later, but the man has to pursue. You talk to her father. Hopefully he's a godly man. And then you make a plan for your courtship. And then you'll bring the daughter into the mix later. And this is not arranged marriage, he says. It's no, because you can still, yeah, I mean, it's not arranged by the parents, but you, I mean, what the fuck is the difference, honestly? So part two jumps into the practical issues of what he calls the season of courtship. So so he talks a lot about guarding each other's hearts in this chapter. And then also they just want to deepen their friendship. He says, the focus of your friendship in its early stages should be on getting to know each other, not creating premature intimacy and emotional dependence, which like I think in itself might not be horrible advice. Like don't just start emotionally depending on someone as soon as you meet them. But I think the problem is, is that he's like, don't create any emotional dependence until you're fucking married, which I think is just insane. You need the foundation of spirituality oh i love this part you can do things together to deepen your relationship with god but you have to be careful so there is this story do you remember this one that the couple they like sit in the guy's car to talk about god but it was just a front and they're praying and it gets too it gets too heated it gets too spicy and so he's like don't pray it's too it's too intimate now you told the story in the i kiss dating goodbye episode about a couple that you knew that courted that wouldn't pray together alone because it was too intimate they also wouldn't hang out after 10 p.m and again they made their choices and they were very very judgmental of anyone else that didn't follow their choices and now they're divorced <gasps> anyway that's just... and i'm sorry that they're divorced of course so and you, you shouldn't be like sexually accountable like you your accountability partner should not be this person because nothing should ever be of a sexual nature your primary source of accountability like for your sexual sins or lust or masturbation should always be members of the same sex so next is the gender roles within romance. The first quote says, men, 
It's our privilege to be initiators of romantic expression in our courtship. And ladies, I love how he says ladies. It's appropriate for you to respond to the guy's increased romance. Your goal should be to match, but not outpace him. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then before we jump into generals, he just says something quickly about how, like, when you should say I love you to your partner. He says, there's no hard and fast rule here. We need wisdom. I chose to say the words I love you for the first time when I asked Shannon to marry me. Can you imagine dating somebody? And they don't say I love you until you propose? No. That is so fucking backwards. It's the principle of like, we have a very rigid legalistic formula here and you should follow it. You should not go with your gut. Because love is such a, it's like such an emotional, hormonal feeling that you get. And it's like, you should say that when you feel it. Yeah. Anyway, he goes on and on about communication. Like, he talks about that horrible book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. He talks about how, like, you have to learn to communicate as a couple. Like, I have a 23-year-old who just got married who's telling me how to communicate as a couple. Can I just read a quote? Yeah. So, he says, The state of human sexuality today is like a play in which the cast is in rebellion against the playwright and his story. Imagine the chaos. The actors hate him. They reject their roles and mock the script. To show their contempt, some even refuse to read their lines. Other actors switch their roles and costumes to confuse the plot. Still, others read their parts out of place, slur their lines, and lace them with obscenities. This is a picture of the wicked and perverse generation which Christians are called to shine like stars. It's the generation of the, in quotes, transgendered, Trans- in which men act like women and women act like men. And it's amidst the chaos that God wants his children to be faithful to the roles that he assigned us, even though the majority of humanity has abandoned them. <sighs> I have this quote in my notes, too. And then he goes on to talk about how women are equal but different. We love equal but different. Do you want me to read the next? Because the next quote, it says, Within the context of their equality, God assigned men and women different roles. He made Adam first, signifying his unique role as leader and initiator. He created Eve from Adam and brought her to Adam to be his helper in the tasks God had assigned for them. She was made to complement, nourish, and to help her husband. God's greatest gift to man was a helper suitable for him. Genesis 2.18 Ugh, this doesn't minimize a woman's role, but it does define it. Men and women were created equal yet different. And the fact that we're different is wonderful. What a boring world it would be if the opposite sex weren't so mysterious, so puzzling, and at the time so infuriatingly unlike us. And this, this is the problem. This is the number one problem within patriarchal societies. It's assuming that women are other and different. When you look at the normal curve in terms of like men and women, there's so much more overlap. We are so much more similar than we are different. Mm -hmm. And there's so much variation within men and women. And I just hate this. I just hate this. And I'm quoting men and women because what does that even mean? Apart from chromosomes and like hormones, like what, what differences do we actually have that aren't reproductive that should limit us from doing things? Yeah. So, fuck. Can we talk about the roles? Can we just go go through his list and talk about our thoughts? Uh Uh-huh. So, before we start, I just want to say he talks about, like, masculinity. It's like, men don't know how to be men, so we just do whatever's easiest. Women don't know what it means to be a woman, so they end up acting like men. Like, stuff like that. Okay, so I have to remember that this was written in the early 2000s. So, I have to, like, like, I have to keep telling myself that because I'm so mad. This brought my passion from zero to 100 when i read this like i was like what and yes he has since recanted everything he said yet it's still written down and i'm still mad so and people still think like this well i mean i in my teen years we've gone into the facebook vault we don't need to pull those messages up again we talked about them last time but like i honestly even said you know make space for men to lead like i was getting into that rhetoric like and it never it never felt right But I just could not reconcile what was said within scripture and how it is interpreted within the the very conservative charismatic church that I went to. Yeah, you just want you well, you just want to fit in. 
one thing that this makes me think of these quotes about how like women are equal but different is that it's almost like I feel very patronized by a man who's like, well, I still want to be the leader. So how do I make a woman feel important about her role without actually giving her any leadership? It's like, you know, you're so equal, but not actually, you're below us. But like, don't worry, women, you have a role to play. It feels really patronizing. Equal but different is the dumbest fucking thing because you're like, <laughs> you're equal, but you don't get to make choices. So, so it's not like, you know what I mean? But you're, you're really equal, but you're under my authority. Like, that's not how it works. Parents are not equal to children. Yeah. Like, you're not. You know what I mean? Like, parents make the choices. So are we ready, Jessica? Can I read out the, the let's be men one? Now that we're really, really mad. Yeah. We're really, like, our, our voices have gotten much louder and much more high-pitched since we started this recording. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there is a list, you say? I don't think I have. There is a list. So for men and women, he gives like four tips. So we'll start off with the let's be men. So number one for let's be men is assume the responsibility of leading and initiating in your relationships with women. And he goes on to say that this doesn't mean that you treat women as if you were their husband and the one to lead them in important life decisions. Even during the season of courtship, it isn't your place. Until you're a woman's husband, she is under no obligation to submit to your leadership. Actually, I, I'd like to beg to differ, Josh. A woman is never under obligation to submit to you. But anyway, go on. But if she has a Christian father that offers protection and oversight, that should come from him. Oh, look. Yeah. And he uses examples of like of how that, you know, if people are planning get-togethers, that the guys can plan the get together because like the women always have to make the decisions and women just hate that what women hate what <sighs> having to always be the one to plan things and make decisions i think regardless of your gender that could go either way like there's always one person in a relationship one of them's a planner and one of them just goes along with it that's usually what i'm noticing in relationships that work out you need you need to balance each other out that's for sure but prescribing any sort of rules based on gender is just silly i know lots of women that aren't the planners you, you know we're not even talking about same-sex relationships obviously because he only recognizes a heterosexual because he person. doesn't talk about them oh no, yeah so number two wow oh that was only number one. Oh my god that's number one so number two is be a spiritual leader in your relationships with women and it, he's talking about ways that you can sort of practice so before marriage let's practice leading in biblical fellowship with our friends and during courtship then we'll be that much more prepared to do so with our wives and children. So in the Bible, it says that the man, the husband, will be held accountable for the actions of his wife and children. Like, so he is the one that God will, like, I mean, the woman's still going to be held accountable for her sins, but, like, the man is also held accountable. Like, it's his responsibility to make sure that his family is godly. So that sounds like an awful burden to place on a twenty a twenty men. year old man. Yeah. You're only you are only responsible for your own actions. Actually, it would have been interesting to talk to a man about like, okay, so we are two women who grew up in the church and it'd be interesting to talk to an ex Christian man about what they thought about this book, but Nah. So, okay. Number three, do little things in your relationship with women that communicate your care, respect, and desire to protect. Like what? What things that they could do. Um, like what people might call benevolent sexism, like opening up the door and pulling out the chair and paying for the meal and like... Like gentlemanly stuff? Yeah, gentlemanly stuff. I did have a boyfriend back... Well, I did date a couple good people yeah like, wasn't they weren't all idiots who would open the car door for me and i honestly found it annoying like he was like i just insist on doing it and i was like cool but do you think that i'm so dumb i can't open a car door i didn't say anything i'd let him do it because i just wouldn't i want to be nice yeah i think it's a balance like I, i'll hold the door open for people that are coming after me like obviously you but know like no like every time i got in the car every time i'm not talking like he would open my door for me every time we got in the car oh that's yeah the thing is is that like that was kind of like the only sexist thing he ever did it was actually nice because he wasn't being like well you're the woman you're the weaker vessel it was just kind of like something that he wanted to do it was kind of annoying though but some people do like that and some people don't and i think yeah. everyone's different and that's why this book is so fucking annoying i'm so mad and i think like the protector piece obviously traditionally like on average men are stronger than women so in a heterosexual relationship like if you're getting mugged, it's probably more a guy's instinct to, like, punch the guy instead of, like, throwing you towards the guy. Yeah. Yes. 
So, like, maybe there's, like, a physical protector aspect. It is nice to have somebody that is, like, I'm weak and yeah. I'm physically weak. It is nice to have someone stronger than me. But, like, it is not a prerequisite for me choosing a partner. No. Because I've also dated guys that are definitely weaker than me. <laughs> I think it's so... It's very demeaning. Very demeaning. Very short-sighted. Very black and white. Yeah. By living my life up until now, you learn nothing is black and white. And he is clearly a person who is in his early 20s while he's writing this. Like, it is just so apparent reading this. He's homeschooled. He's never, like, left his hometown. And it's so funny because, like, the the concept of, like, female domesticity and, like, the woman being at home, that didn't really even exist during biblical times because it was, like, pre-industrial revolution. People weren't going out to work. They had a farm. Everyone was working together. Your kids weren't getting educated. Like, you know what I mean? Like, everyone was doing physical labor to survive. Yeah. You know, society is structured very differently now. And it doesn't mean that women in that time were not intelligent or capable either. Yeah. And, like, for men, it's to their advantage to keep women in those roles. Of course. Of course it is because. Feels good to be number one. (laughs) Well, also, like, from a biological standpoint, women have eggs and, like, men can spread their seed. So men traditionally did not want to raise another man's child so they wanted to keep control of the woman that or the women that they had so that they could be sure that their genetic information was passed on yeah by looking at this from like an anthropological perspective it all makes sense and then that's like then you get the theories about how like men naturally aren't monogamous and then we get into that whole fucking thing But I think we can take this data or theories that people have about early humans and people take that and they apply it to gender roles nowadays that they're like, well, well, the women should be controlled by the men because that's what they've always done. So that's a slippery slope. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, his number four is about kind of reinforcing those sort of stereotypes, like encourage women to embrace godly femininity. And this paragraph, oh my god. Godly femininity. When you see a woman going against the grain of culture by cultivating a skill that will serve her family someday, compliment her. When a girl is pursuing a demanding career but is still being feminine, let her know that you notice. Let her know you respect her. Oh, that is so patronizing. What is being feminine? Like, you can still be a career woman, but be feminine. Like, what the what does that even mean? These are Biblical just... femininity is something that I see a lot on TikTok in like the traditional wives TikTok and like kind of anti-feminist TikTok, which does exist, by the way. I think that people don't know what the definition of feminism is. Okay, the definition of feminism, as I understand it, is women should be able to do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah, everyone. Everyone should be able to do whatever the fuck they want. Equal social political rights for everyone. Men, women, non-binary, everyone should just like do whatever the fuck they want, okay? Yeah. Great. We are in agreement here in our little echo chamber about that, but obviously not everybody is. And men don't want this because then they can't control women. Mm -hmm. Biblical femininity, if somebody wants to abide by that, like, great. There are some trad wives online that literally are just like, I don't care if you are a trad wife. I'm just saying that I am, and this works for me. And I respect that. If you want to be a stay-at-home wife, mom, that is your choice, okay? That is what feminism is. It's about you making the choice. Yeah. That's what feminism is. And, like, these women, they're like, oh, don't subscribe to feminism because women can't be women anymore. And it's like, no, that's the point of feminism is that you can choose to be whatever you fuck you want to be. That you're not, you're not forced into a role that you don't want. If you want a traditional role. What society is going towards, hopefully, as we try to fucking progress, for the love of God, can we progress as a society without old white men telling us not to progress, is that people should be able to do whatever the fuck they want to do if it's not harming somebody else. Yes. Somebody might take my argument and tell me that I'm saying that women shouldn't be staying at home and that women should go to work and this and that and what I'm saying and what I've said 50 times is that women should be able to make whatever decision they want to make in their relationship or outside of their relationship or whatever like that is what feminism is and I find it but these ideals in this book these rules on how to be godly men and women if you are in a relationship with someone that is not a good human if you're as a woman and you're in a relationship with a man like this opens up the possibility for all kinds of abuse whether that be sexual or financial or emotional or even physical yeah I'm not saying that this book's like we're promoting abuse but when you have that power imbalance and you're saying that okay you have to submit to the authority of your husband 
Like, oof, that's some pretty bad advice in my opinion. Obviously, Josh Harris didn't go out to write this book to be like, I hope that men can now abuse their wives. Yeah. But it does open that door because I think what he's not considering while writing this book is that a lot of people fucking suck. Yeah. Like, so rant over but i just felt you know we are sitting in our echo chamber but i truly just think that like if more people just (laughs) understood what the definition of feminism is i think that the world would be a little bit better (laughs) like i mean we know that countries where women get more education get married later have children later we know that these countries do better economically and we know that the children are healthier and we know that People live longer. Like, poverty is less. Clearly, I think while he's writing this, he doesn't even realize how sexist he's being because he doesn't even understand the definition of sexism or the definition of feminism. No. But, like, he's just saying that men should lead and women need to follow. And that is not going to progress society in any way. But people can't really, like, wrap their minds around that because they just want to be number one. Oh, of course. And, like, I remember growing up the way that sometimes headship and submission would be characterized. Like, they would say well you know if you have a company you need someone to have the final say and make decisions you need you know you need a ceo and it's like a relationship a marriage a partnership is not a company yeah and it's different like people yeah people have feelings and people have complex emotions about things and yeah there shouldn't be just one person making the decisions even though in our submission and headship episode a lot of people do the 51 50 rule so like they make decisions together but the husband always has a final say if they don't agree on something right that obviously made me really mad because I just don't think anyone should have the final say in anything. Like, if you're not in agreement on something, yeah, then you need to find a compromise. But, like, he ties back this women wanting to be in control to original sin. Like, he says, like... Really? Yeah. Man's biggest temptation is to be passive, like Adam was. Like, Adam wasn't there protecting Eve from the snake. And woman's biggest temptation is to take control. Whoa. It even says, like, in God's curse to humanity after they've eaten the apple, he says, like, to the woman, like, you're going to have pain in childbirth. And also, like, your desire will be for the man, but he will rule over you. They're like, this is a result of sin. And it, in the perfect world, the man would be protecting the woman and she wouldn't have gotten led astray. I just want to say, like, how convenient for men that this <laughs> story exists. How convenient. How convenient. Do you want to hear his advice for women? I do. Am I going to be even more mad that? I am right now because I'm not sure if it's possible. Wow. He says, <laughs> Girls, I hope you're still reading. I know that parts of this chapter might have made you cringe. Yes, Josh. Yes, they did. And then he's like, Women are supposed to respond to godly leadership from men. Give me a break. I think I can understand how you might feel. No, I don't think you can. I don't think you can, 22 year old Josh. Yeah, and he's like, the Bible's, it's just been misapplied by domineering men. Like, that's not the case. So then he goes on and he's like, Number one, in your relationships with godly men, encourage and make room for them to practice servant leadership. Then he says, be a sister to the men in your life. Cultivate the attitude that motherhood is noble and fulfilling (gasps) calling. But he doesn't talk about fatherhood. And I'm like, oh, buddy, like what a fucking shitstorm you're opening right now by saying that to women. Like, go fuck yourself. That's all I got to say. And I mean, it gets worse. (laughs) Number four is... I think It Gets Worse should be the intro to this podcast. Yeah, it just keeps getting worse. It just keeps getting worse. Because he's like, During our courtship, Shannon honored me by always acting and dressing modestly. A few times that meant getting rid of outfits that she didn't think would cause a problem. Ladies, you'll never know just how differently you're wired until you get married. Like, I, I remember hearing all this shit, and he says, Once when I told her that a particular pair of shorts were a little too short and were causing me to struggle, she quickly replaced them. okay (laughs) that has red flags for abusive relationship all over it if you are telling your partner what to wear but he's like but it was good intentions because i don't want to stumble and i'm like okay if what i'm wearing is causing you to stumble how is that my problem i'm not walking around naked in front of you being like don't look it's like the meme we saw that was like instead of telling women to dress more modestly why don't you gouge your eyes out like jesus said (laughs) (laughs) that's what jesus if you're being a creep or if you're falling into like committing adultery or you're like looking at women as if they're objects gouge your eyes out man 
because it is your fault. So just gouge them out. I, I don't see an issue with this, Josh. Just gouge your yeah, eyes gouge out. Your eyes I don't... Out. Then she can wear whatever the fuck she wants, and it's fine. But but don't worry. We're just taking it out of context, Sarah, because we're emotional women. <gasps> we, we're emotional, not visual. <laughs> and I mean, yes, there are studies that show that, like, the masturbatory patterns of, like, women and men tend to be different. Women tend to be more into literature, and men tend to be more into porn. But that's not mutually exclusive. And if you are taught that women's bodies need to be covered and you aren't like a, if it's not normalized just being around like different types of human bodies, you're going to be shocked when you see like an arm or like, God forbid, some cleavage or like some thigh. Oh, no. And you were homeschooled, so it's not like you even went to school and saw other women. Yeah. That's his social circle was his church. Yeah. So he grew up in like what I'm assuming is like middle class America. He was homeschooled. He grew up very Christian. He ended up being a pastor. Like, what kind of worldview does he have? And it's very, very limited. Do you want to know what kind of worldview he has? <sighs> no. I have a story for you right now. Okay. Is it the hammock? Yeah. Are we at the hammock yet? Okay. This story was burned into my mind for for decades. Why? Why was the story? I don't know. It what, just what, what impacted you? Well, like it was the whole. Okay, the, I'll tell you the part as Kay. we get to it. So he was basically like with a friend and with his. Fian- they were engaged. They're engaged. Fiance. They were engaged. Two months ago till they're married and like, you know, they were like, all right. They're visiting her father. They're visiting her father and like, let's cuddle in a hammock. And so one of his friends was like, don't do it. No, no, no. That's not his friend. He's having the argument in his mind. Oh my God. He's having the argument in his mind. You're totally right. Yeah. (laughs) So, so basically the chapter is an argument he's having with himself while napping in a hammock with Shannon. He finally gets up and says, I shouldn't be in this with you. I said, I'm sorry, but I'm enjoying this for the wrong reasons. I'm sorry I suggested it. I just need to take a walk. And she was like, okay. And so the argument he's having in his head is like, his conscience is like, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. Stop looking at her legs. Yeah, stop looking at her legs. And and then, but he's like, oh, it's not that bad. But then he gets up and leaves. He goes on to say... The man and woman who embrace the immediate pleasure of sex outside marriage may think that they are experiencing freedom, but the opposite is true. The tendencies of sin are reaching up, binding them, and dragging them towards death. That quote, that quote, is wild. He was lying in a hammock and he checked out his girlfriend's legs and that was like the biggest internal battle for him like that is mind-blowing to me most people would have been like okay i'm gonna have a nap in a hammock with my fiance who i'm about to marry and it wouldn't have been sexual because when you start repressing all of those things the smallest thing becomes so tempting and sexual and he never talks about repression there's no repression talk in this book this is like the last christian i ever dated the last christian i ever dated was when i was 20 and I think I've told you about this guy. This was the guy that listened to poetry whenever he had the the need to masturbate. No. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, we talked about him in the masturbation episode. For those who haven't listened to the masturbation episode, I just have to say, this guy, he had accountability group. And then if any of them ever masturbated, they had to watch this specific spoken word poetry that we played. And it's Levi the Poet. Levi the Poet. Levi it's the called poet. Kaleidoscope. And it's just, I'll never forget it. But I do want to say that there's more quotes that I have from the story. Yeah. Of the hammock. So he says that scripture doesn't deny the pleasure of illicit sex. Yes, it'll feel good. Yes, it can be exciting. But the pleasure is empty compared to the joys of married love and foolish in the light of the dire consequences that visit soul, body, and emotions. Within marriage, sex is beautiful fulfilling creative says john MacArthur, whoever the fuck that is outside of marriage it is ugly destructive and damning um okay like oh my god what is the payoff of sexual sin you will lose your honor and hand over to merciless people everything you have achieved in life a little extreme (laughs) strangers will obtain your wealth and someone else will enjoy the fruit of your labor afterward you will groan in anguish when diseases consume your body (laughs) so then he goes on and talks about like three different stories about people who had premarital sex and ended up with like diseases and like unwanted pregnancy and yeah like aids yes which is like so crazy and i just have to play this short clip i i i I found a clip like all It makes me think of mean girls when they're like you you will get pregnant. Is that the clip? Is that the clip? <laughs> okay. Um can you <laughs> So okay, I just literally screamed onto the microphone. I'm sure I woke up everyone in my house. Um Okay, so I have the clip. So this has like super mean girl vibes. So the clip for mean girls, let's just watch it, because it's so good. At your age, you're going to be having a lot of urges. You're going to want to take off your clothes and touch each other. But if you do touch each other, you will get chlamydia and die. (laughs) 
You will get diseases. Diseases. You will get diseases and die. Oh my gosh. So guidelines, guidelines. We're gonna get to the yeah the guidelines that him and Shannon came up with. But yes, that chapter had real vibes of if you have sex, you're gonna die. So him and Shannon came up with guidelines, and they're like, he's like, you don't have to follow these for you, but this is what we did, and it's <sighs> number one, we will not caress each other. For us, this excludes. I love just like how specific he is. Yes. So when he says excludes, that means that he can do this or he can't do this. He can't do this. For us, this excludes rubbing each other's back, neck, or arms, touching or stroking each other's face, playing with each other's hair, scratching each other's arms or back. Like, oh, the fact gosh. that he sexualizes these simple actions is just alarming because this is what, as parents, we do with our children to give them affection. Like, these are affectionate. These are not sexual actions. Can you imagine marrying someone without even just, like, touching their arm? Or cuddling. Okay, n- which is the next guideline. We will not, quote unquote, cuddle. So what does that exclude? For us, this excludes sitting entwined on a couch to watch a movie. Ooh. Got to keep a Bible between you. That was a rule. That was a rule at Christian camp. <laughs> six inches. Six inches. Six inch rule between genders. Leave room for Jesus. No leaning or resting on the other person. No lying down next to each other. No playful wrestling. Oh, playful wrestling. That's an interesting one because that could turn sexual real fast. So that that is like, I don't agree with it, but I'm like, okay, I can see how that's the only thing that could turn sexual. Yeah. So what do you do when you are watching a movie? You sit on different couches? No, no, no. He's going to tell you what you can do. So no, no, no. We'll get there. Oh, so sorry. Oh, my God. Number three, we will guard our conversation and meditation. For us, this means not talking about our future physical relationship. That's good. We can't have sex and we also can't talk about it. Like, I I understand you don't want to, like, talk about really erotic stuff, but, like, maybe you should make sure you're on the same page about lots of things before you get married. Anyway. (laughs) Not thinking or dwelling on what would be sinful, not reading things related to physical intimacy within marriage prematurely. Okay. (laughs) Oh, okay. We will not spend undue amounts of time together at late hours. Because we're more vulnerable when we're tired, even if we haven't compromised, please ask us if we're spending too much time together at late hours. Again, not bad advice if you don't want to make a bad decision and you're tired. This is giving me, like, real fucking flashbacks. They put these guidelines on Shannon's fridge. Her roommates put them on the fridge for her. That sure as hell was not on our fridge when we were that age, Jess. (laughs) When we lived together. (laughs) Yeah, because I guess we would have lived together around this age. Yeah, that wasn't on our fridge. (laughs) Yeah. So number five is what you can do. So appropriate physical expressions during this season include holding hands. So you can sit next to each other on the couch and hold hands. Okay. Josh putting his arm around Shannon's shoulder. Shannon cannot put her arm around Josh's shoulder, though. (laughs) That's exactly what I was just going to say. Can she do it? No. Okay. Brief side hugs. Oh, brief side hugs. I love a side hug. No full frontal. I love a good, yeah, an awkward, like, side hug. Oh, my God. Side hug. Can you imagine being like, we're engaged. Me. Side side hug. hug. (laughs) You're engaged, and you haven't even hugged. Like, Guys. And I've been to weddings where the people had not slept together. I've been to weddings where the people had not kissed before and they shared their first kiss on the altar, their first kiss with anyone. That was their choice. And like, you know, some of these people are still married and happy. Some of them aren't. I personally would not, that would not be my point of view of something I would do in my life or recommend to anyone. I am imagining so many people who started courting and they're like well if i follow these rules i'll automatically be sexually compatible with my partner and then they're not following their gut because sometimes you can kind of be like oh maybe i'm not really that attracted to this person but don't worry once we get married god will provide and then they get married and nothing fucking changes i am sure this has happened many times and i mean like even josh harris in his book the picture that he paints he's like We barely had to leave the bedroom on our honeymoon because we had such a great time delighting in each other's bodies. So much sex. Do you know how many Christians I know or people that have deconstructed that this view of sexuality and all the guilt around it has actually messed up their ability to have sex? Uh, I'd like to raise my hand because this view of sex gave me vaginismus and that particular disorder a lot of the times it's psychological it's a lot of tension and tightness in your pelvic floor because of guilt like the mind and the body connection you can't just like sever that after years of conditioning i was lucky that my mom i was able to talk to her about this and eventually got through it at least physically got through it mentally it took many more years of deconditioning to be able to be like oh i can have sex and i'm married so i'm now within like you know having marital sex 
and still sometimes it pops up this guilt it doesn't just turn off that's the problem and also like the view of sex that is presented within christianity and that was much more popular view of sex in the 90s and 2000s like remember when monica Lewinsky and i love her by the way she's like the best oh yeah she's She's awesome, but, like, Bill Clinton was like, I did not have sexual relations with this woman. And that is when, you know, in society at that point, we had this view of sex that sex starts when the penis goes in the vagina and it ends when the man comes. (laughs) And so when there's zero agency that's taught to women about their sexuality, their body, and when it's all centered around the man's dick, it's just this very narrow view of sex. And it doesn't leave space for anything else. It doesn't, it's just not healthy. Like human sexuality is so much more than just P and B. I hope that Josh is telling the truth in this book and that him and his wife for a long time had a good sex life. I hope that's true. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of Christians that do go on and have good sex lives. But for some people, it has long-term psychological issues. So we've talked about this in past episodes, but when I was in high school, I was in a Christian relationship and we talked years later and we were both just like, I wish we would have just like fucking relaxed and just like not been so intense. Yeah. Like the amount of like mind energy. Anyway. So, so I don't have, it's not in the Facebook vault. Unfortunately, I just checked, but I do remember it must've maybe it was on MSN or maybe we were texting like regular people. But it's not in the Facebook vault, but we did say, I wish we would have just been a little more chill because I don't think we ever would have stayed together, but at least we wouldn't have been so insane and damaged. And that relationship was so bad. Do you want to see the worst thing I've ever found on the Facebook vault? Oh, no. (laughs) Yes. This is April 22nd, 2007. (laughs) And I don't remember doing this, but okay. I I randomly messaged this guy who lives in Bloomington, Indiana. (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) what? Oh my God, someone rein me in. I can't. Okay. Hey, this is random, but I saw your post on the Christian singles group and you're like the only one who's in high school. Being single is so crappy. All my closest friends, guys and girls, seem to be dating or in a relationship. It's hard because their boyfriend or girlfriend take priority and I end up being a third wheel at best or worse, neglected. It seems like there aren't any guys out there that care about God and stuff. Maybe my standards are too high. But is it too much to want someone who is a strong Christian, doesn't drink, underage, is semi-good looking and funny? My worst fear is that I'll never get married. I've dated people, but it never has really worked out, so it sucks. And he says, I agree 100%. And I feel the same way. Like, I set my standards too high. And then I was like, what are your standards? And he's like, well, Christian, of course, non-smoker. She can drink if she don't do it to get drunk because that's just stupid. No drugs, no cussing, pretty, funny, great personality, and is just downright awesome. If I see a girl in a car and I think she's cute and see a cig in her hand, I get, I just turn and don't even take a second look. Um, her background I don't care about as long as God is in her future um and that she wants to be number one with him and i'm like that sounds like your your standards are high but attainable yeah i don't like why am i talking yeah they are i'm trying to my heart is to just lower them but i don't know um i'm mortified for you right now do you have my do you have my space add me do you have my space well i never go on there because it's from like three years ago lol but i have msn do you if so add me <laughs> And then what? Do you think that they added and that, you? And then it just, eh, oh my God. I. So <sighs> what was your intention in messaging this guy? I don't know, man. I was all over Christian chat rooms at that point. So I Also, just... in the masturbation episode, we talked about how you like talked to some girl who was definitely like a predator. <laughs> well, yeah. I cringed so hard. And he, I was just like messaging this, this random fucking guy. Like, I don't know, man. So, okay. We talked about the guidelines. That feels like an eternity ago right now. What is next? Now, part three, this is where also right after these rules is when we find out that Shannon lost her virginity at 14 and she had to like tell him and he was like, he seemed to take it well in the book. Yeah, he He did. Like he seemed to be like, well, I have my own sexual sin. Then he talks about God's forgiveness and that that's the reason that Jesus died for our sins. So he talks about that a bunch. So that's about page 200. And then that's where I stopped reading. So then we get to part three. 
I think. I don't think there's anything good until part three. So uh, part three is when couples are more serious about moving towards marriage in a God honoring way. So we'll see how God's grace can help us face the sins from our past. So that's when he talks about forgiveness so that if we lustfully looked at a woman when we were 15 years old, that he has forgiven us for that. We'll ask some tough questions before engagement, including the all-important one, should we call our courtship off? Finally, we'll be reminded of God's grace is our ultimate source of confidence for joining our hearts and lives in the vows of marriage. So, anything good in there? Um, Some questions to ask before buying the ring. So, number one is, is your relationship centered on God and his glory? So, number, number two, question to ask. I don't disagree with this. It's like, are you growing in friendship, communication, fellowship, and romance? It's good to be growing in all those things. Yeah, sure. Number three, though. Are you clear on your biblical roles as man and woman? Here we go again, Josh. And do you, do you agree? Like, do you agree on what these roles are? Like, if you're a woman, ask yourself if this man is someone you could respect, submit to, and love. And if you respect your husband, submitting to him will be a joy. And if you're a man, are you currently initiating and leading in the relationship? Do you have the faith to lead this woman and serve her in love for your life? I'm sorry, but the the phrase servant leadership just pisses me off. Like, they'll say that Jesus was a servant leader because he was, like, you know, he was, like, serving other people, but he was ultimately the one in charge. And I don't know that he would have ever labeled himself that way, but good guy Paul labeled. I can't wait to talk more about Paul. He comes up a lot in any research I do. We don't don't like Paul. If anyone wants to know, we don't like Paul. I think Paul ruined Jesus' message. It, it really feels like that now. I have misconstrued. Yeah, misconstrued. and I'm, I am looking forward to really like diving deep into into the world of Paul. Number four. Okay. Are other people supportive of your relationship? That's a good one. Yeah. Number five is sexual desire playing too big or too small a part in your decision. I mean, that's not a bad one because like if you're only getting married because you want to have sex, maybe too big of a role. We've seen it so many times and everyone denies it and i mean i get it your hormones are raging at that point and there's even a verse in the bible that says it's better to get married than to burn with passion there you have it guess who said that paul paul fucking paul man paul 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 Paul. number six do you have a track record of solving problems biblically if you're a christian and your worldview is based on the bible i don't see that as a bad one i guess Are you heading in the same direction in life? This is a good one. That's actually a very good question. Yeah. Number eight, like, number eight, I see, I just, I (laughs) don't like it. Have you taken into account any cultural differences you have? What is that? My friends, Corey and Kathy, got engaged only after they had seriously considered the challenges that they would face in an interracial marriage. Corey is black. Kathy is white. While walking with Kathy on the streets, Corey would be called a sellout by other blacks. Kathy had to patiently talk through the issues with her parents, who were initially opposed to the relationship. Whoa. Are interracial marriages on biblical? Definitely not. Okay. But they should not be approached thoughtlessly. Um, <laughs> I don't really know. Sarah's hiding her face from the book. What do we... Oh my god, Josh. I remember when we first started reading this book for this episode and you were like, there's racist stuff in it. And I was like, really? I don't remember. Like, I hadn't seen it. And here we are. Um, why do we even have to talk about this? Yeah. If you have cultural differences in your relationship, if you are dating someone who is from a different culture, I think you're aware of that by this point but just because there are racist people that are calling them out on the street that's not a them problem that's a racist people problem that's not the couple's problem yeah that's just racist fucking people oh josh fuck um do any of you have complicating entanglements from past marriages or relationships oh wow okay again things that you you probably have discussed before you get engaged to someone is what has your life been like up until now it's like, it's as if they're not even talking. The best one, though. Number 10, do you want to marry this person? That's that's the last question. That's, that's the last question. Before you get engaged. <laughs> <laughs> the final question you should ask yourself, do I want to marry this person? And does this person want to marry me? Wow. The final question out of 10 questions about whether or not you should get married is, do you want to? Oh my god. Getting married is your choice. You are the one who will affirm the vows and say I do. No one and no leading can constrain or compel you to make these vows. 
I am horrified. I'm horrified that that is the last question and not the title of the fucking book. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm shook now. So, um, is that kind of the end of the book? That's the end of the book. Yeah, basically. I have a question for you. What? Would you like to know what Sean McDowell thinks about courtship and dating? Yeah, I would, actually. I have a little video. Okay. How far is too far? Well, if you're looking for a Bible verse to answer this, you're not going to find it. Because the Bible doesn't talk about modern dating. People would get married because it was arranged. But today, things are different. Well, the Bible, again, is not going to tell you exactly if you can kiss or how long you can kiss or where you put your body, but the Bible does something very different. Rather than giving us specific rules, it gives us principles that we are to live out in our relationships. So if you look, for example, in the book of Philippians, it says, think about things that are lovely and worthy of praise, things that are just, things that are pure. So I would challenge people in terms of how far is too far, in a relationship, at what point are you pushing somebody where you realize you're not thinking about things that are pure? You're not thinking about things that are just. And in so doing, you're not really loving this person. So instead of asking the question, how far is too far, what can I get? Ask, how do I love this person? And how do I help this person think about things that are lovely and pure and worthy of praise? That'll help answer a lot of it. I'm just gonna say that I think that sex in and of itself is lovely and pure and worthy of praise. And I think that the fact that we say that sex is impure is just very sad because sex is something that is complicated, beautiful human experience. Yeah, like I think the one thing that he said is that, and, and I don't, okay, I don't hate his answer. Like, no, neither. I think his answer is fine. I feel like he's kind of our go to on like, what's the like, the reasonable Christian view? Like, I know. What's and he's intelligent and he, you know, he, he has reasons as to why he believes things. And... Yeah, yeah. I, one thing that I don't like that he says, though, is he's like, if you're thinking things that are unpure, then you're not loving this person. And, and I beg to differ. Sometimes you can have a relationship with someone that is just a relationship. I think a lot of people are like, you can't have a relationship with someone unless you want to get married to them. I think that's like a huge downside of society, honestly. And like the people that are commenting on my video on Instagram are like mad at me because people date without wanting to get married and some people don't ever want to get married yeah and that's amazing a lot of people have told me that too on the on the video and and then how he says yeah if you're basically if you're lusting after somebody if you're lusting after your partner and you're thinking unpure thoughts and you're not loving them and i don't think that's right i agree that, that that's all i really have to say like i mean i i don't really have the right words for it do you have the right words for it so he's saying like if if you're looking at someone with lust someone that you're dating too yeah someone that you're dating and you find them attractive and it's bringing you physical pleasure that that's wrong i think that's just sad because that person if they love you and they're your partner like it can be healthy for them to feel good that you find them attractive that's like a, a positive thing it's not a, necessarily a selfish thing and along those lines like a lot of the issues that i had about intimacy were to do with that is like if my husband is thinking about me lustfully like that isn't a bad thing because like i said when you get married that stuff doesn't just turn off no. You still feel that way. Marriage doesn't just like fix these things that have been conditioned into your brain over years and years. So, yeah, I yeah, I don't love it. I don't hate him. I don't love what his message was. But in that video, it says that he's the author of Chasing Love. We talked about Chasing Love in our Purity Ring episode because he wrote the True Love Waits book, and that's a purity movement. And we read his book. I read quite a few excerpts from the book but one that i wanted to talk about again was the purpose of sex so he says in sum the purpose of sex is threefold procreation unity and the anticipation of heaven understanding these truths and orienting our lives around them sets us free to experience love sex and relationships as god designed them to be experienced so that's like a really good sum up of like almost the entire book a lot a little bit it's a little bit transphobic it's a little bit sexist but honestly chasing love is not worse than josh harris's book josh harris's book is a thousand times worse than chasing love so that that's the i just wanted to see what sean mcdowell thought about dating so that's actually for me yeah i'm just looking into what story oh my god you know what's funny is that we forgot to do story time with sarah in the last episode but the whole episode was like a story time with sarah because it was like the creation story yeah but still we did forget to do it so we're back on track now okay so what are we going to talk about for our story time today sarah 
Today we are going to talk about the story of Dinah. And so Dinah is the only daughter of Jacob and Leah. If you remember, Jacob married two sisters, Rachel and Leah, and they each bore him six sons. And those were like the 12 tribes of Israel. So she's the only daughter born. So this is Genesis 30 to 34-ish. So what happens is Dinah went out to visit some women, the women of Seshem, where her people had made camp and where her father Jacob had purchased the land where he had pitched his tent. And then then like a man who was a prince of the land took her and raped her. And then her father found out and the guy that raped her was like, I want her to be my wife. And then he's like, I'll give my daughters to your sons if you let your daughter be my wife and then we can all live together. And then the father, Jacob, was like, okay, sure, but you all have to get circumcised. And so <laughs> all, all your adult men in your tribe have to get circumcised if you want to be with like Jewish women and Jewish men. Like you all have to get circumcised. So all these men got circumcised and they're all, they're all like in a lot of pain. They can't do a lot. And then Jacob and Leah and Simeon and Levi and Dinah's brothers, all of them came with uh, their swords and they like killed all of the men. Um, Shut the fuck up, really? Yeah, they killed they killed all of them because they're like, "Fuck you for raping our sister," and they went and killed all the men. And then this story is getting so much better. And the sons of Jacob plundered whatever was in the city and in the fields, all their wealth, all the the little ones, their wives. So I mean, that's that's not great, but <laughs> but I think it is great that Jacob stuck up for his daughter and didn't make her marry her rapist, like is recommended in that is in Deuteronomy. Yeah, so this is pre Deuteronomy. Okay, so so why did I tell this story? Yeah. I told this story because I think that, yes, it does not directly relate to the book, but when you look at women as property, the the whole system of courtship, like even the man asking for permission to either court or get engaged to or marry the woman, that's very, it's just problematic because it, it assumes that the woman, the tradi- I mean, I'm not saying everyone who, like I know that some guys ask for permission and it's just like a nice gesture and it's, kind of base it's based on tradition but i think it's from a problematic tradition of like women being not an agent in and of herself but being property being under the authority of her father and then that that authority gets transferred to her husband on her wedding day when she's given away but yeah essentially that story just kind of shows that like you know women were seen as property but kudos to jacob i respect that he told them all to get circumcised and lied to them and then killed them that's like, just that's a classic bible story right there so what did we learn today sarah uh, we learned that people change and it's not always best to follow the advice of a 22 year old or to follow absolutist guidelines that are super black and white and have no room for nuance or gray what do you think jess if you follow the rules it doesn't guarantee you a happy marriage and marriage doesn't fix your problems having kids doesn't fix your problems stop doing those things to try to fix your problems go fix your problems all right I think that's a wrap. Wrap your dicks. Don't have sex and get pregnant and die. (laughs) And follow the rules for biblical masculinity and femininity. We are firing on all cylinders today. Oh, I think reading that book gave me less brain cells or something. Holy shit, yes. I, I agree. I am also stupider after reading this book. Yeah, all right.